Good evening, everybody. This is Darius Sassemi with GV Wire, and this is... Mike Carbasi, Councilman, City of Fresno. Cool. Good evening, Mike. Dr. Sassemi. How are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, welcome to another episode of Unfiltered, coming to you again live from this beautiful, gorgeous Fresno, California. Uh, our main topic tonight is ACE, actually. Yep. Uh, what is ACE? Uh, we're going to let uh, George Vodanovich and uh, Roddy Lowry to discuss um, what... Okay, I'm going to give a teaser. Yeah. Adverse, adverse... Go. No, adverse childhood experiences. So they'll talk about that, uh, issues, impacts, uh, how do we prevent it, avoid it, uh, what is the impact on folks. Um, but before we get there, lots happening. Uh, Mike, should we start with... Uh, uh, well, we should start, probably start with our poll. Yeah. Okay, let's put the poll up, please. Okay, should uh, Hunter Biden be indicted? So out of the respondents on uh, GVWire Facebook uh, poll, which is scientific, but we don't know what the reach is exactly, uh, over 80% said yes, no one is above the law. Well, there were zero undecided, so people have made their minds up one way or another. There we go. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, let's move. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's lots of talk of carbon, carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Is it the, the Europeans are working on uh, with, some, with technology and funded by some oil company to uh, spend billions of dollars taking carbon out mm -hmm. of the air, mm -hmm. uh, carbon dioxide, and then pumping it into the ground. Well, one of the <clears throat> images we were, uh, the image we have actually on the screen right now is a really cheap way of doing that, which is called trees. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go spend billions of dollars. In the valley, we do a lot of farming. Uh, so as um, Mr. Aiello talked about uh, last week, uh, you weren't here. I wasn't here last you week, here. unfortunately. Okay. No. Jeff... Jeff Aiello yep. talked, talked last week about, hey, you know, trees take care of uh, carbon dioxide sequestration. And they're free. not only are they free, they put oxygen back into the air and they produce uh, some kind of a product or commodity that we can enjoy, eat, uh, export, make money on. And it reduces temperatures overall in our community. Yeah, like exactly. Right shade. It's a big deal. Absolutely. And exactly. it's cheaper. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it's free. And it's from <laughs> Central California. <laughs> so... A lot of, by the way, a lot of great nurseries uh, here locally that make, mm -hmm. you know, not make trees, uh, that, that, you know. Sell trees. And sell that. trees, grow trees. Um, so I've got a lot of trees in my backyard. And I recently added about eight cherry trees. I'm going to come the, over when they're ready. Yes, next, next spring. All right. Okay, or I should say <laughs> early summer. Um, the CPUC, will, we talked about this at one of the shows a few weeks ago. They will decide on solar rates for tenants on apartments, future tenants, uh, September 21st. Do we have that date up? Uh, it's, on, it's on their web page, and it's also on GV Wire's uh, main page. Countdown, September 21st is the day they're going to make that uh, decision. So if you, want, if you want your voices to be heard on, basically, don't take my solar electricity and force me to sell it to PG&E at wholesale prices, which is $0.05 cents a kilowatt hour, and only to turn around and buy it back at 25 and four, over $0.40 cents a kilowatt hour. You know what's frustrating? First of all, I'm really glad that we're showing the pictures of these five people on slide five every show, because they're unelected, which is really unfortunate, point. making such critical decisions. But part of the reason why, as a taxpayer, we pay lots of taxes, and those taxes for the state are subsidies for solar. Part of the hope is it'll help reduce the energy costs for a family, for working families, and make it easier for them to survive in this economy. But exactly. now, this is totally unfair saying, okay, you have that advantage, taxpayers funded that, but instead <clears> all we're doing is creating free power plants for PG&E, PG take the power from your home, put it on their system, and right back to you, and t sell it at, what, three, four times the rate. That's totally unfair. Taxpayers okay. shouldn't be subsidizing that. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's put on the next uh, slide, uh, slide seven. 
Needle exchange will not happen in downtown Fresno, says Dyer and uh, con not con council member, council men. Um, do we have that up? There we go. Article, uh, Mike, any comments on this? The, so the, the county of Fresno allowed a needle exchange right. uh, program for actually, I think, helping fund it. Uh, but the mayor said no, and uh, Councilmember Arias and Councilmember Bredefeld had a press conference talking about that. Well, let's not forget it's campaign season. Um, yeah. Needle exchange has been happening for a very long time in Fresno County, and now there's a big press conference, and there's a lot of uh, angry things being said to the county, which makes it really difficult for those of us that actually want to work and get things done because we need to work together. I didn't hear a lot of solutions yesterday, just finger-pointing. The one dilemma is we have a lot of homeless people in downtown. Where else do you want to do a needle exchange? You want um, hepatitis C rates going up. Now, I will say this to, to Councilman Bredefeld's credit. I do want to see the data that shows needle exchanges reduces opiate use rates in Fresno County. I don't want to see national data. I do want to see how it does it here because my support for continuing this program is going to be contingent on the fact that it works or not. So I'm very interested in seeing that. Okay. Well, and, and the, the key is, does it actually reduce infections, mm -hmm. which means Absolutely. does it reduce uh, health care costs yep. uh, in, in Fresno County? My biggest concern, and I've heard this a lot, um, Osa de Oro Park in my district. It's a flood control park, but it's located on Forkner, and the number of times people reach out to me and say, you know, I bring my disabled child there, and there is a needle, and send me pictures. That's very frustrating. Now, it doesn't mean it's because of the needle exchange program, but this is an ongoing problem that we have to be concerned about, because nobody wants to get poked by a needle, unfortunately. Yeah, you never exactly. know. You never know. You're playing roulette. So. Exactly. Okay. Uh, next item before we get into we're bringing George and Rodney. Uh, Fre is there a Fresno teacher strike looming? Uh, this got this came out, I believe, uh, yesterday. Um, that's right. It came out yesterday on GB Wire. Uh, a potential Fresno teacher strike. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I believe they have a proposed 20% uh, or 19% raise on the, on the docket. And I think they're walking away from that. I, have, I haven't read the article, but I believe that's... Uh, so if those of you that are interested in education and where the teachers are and their pay, and, or if you're a teacher and you didn't know uh, where the negotiations are ending, please read that article. Nancy Price did a great job. Uh, a lot of details on um, what the proposals are and where the district is versus the union and whether uh, they have an agreement or they're going to strike despite the uh, increase. Um, Inga says needle exchange pro promotes drug use, so stop use promoting drug use. A question for Inga is what about the folks that already are using drugs and are spreading their disease through intravenous measures uh, to other drug users. So in other words, if I don't, if there's a needle exchange promotes drug use, I'm like, how does that work? I, I wish Inga was on the show because I've thought about that. You have to actually have a needle mm -hmm. to take it in. You don't go in there and say, give me a needle because I now want to inject myself. That doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, it's called an exchange. So you take your existing needle, uh, instead of reusing it and having somebody else use it, you take it in, get a fresh one, so maybe you know, they're, yeah. And to, so Inga was a nurse, and to, to her point, maybe, and this is a fair point, maybe it maybe doesn't promote <laughs> but enables continued use of drugs and doesn't force people into treatment programs. But at the same time, I want to know, is there data that shows that by not reusing needles, the chance of passing on diseases, whether it's a fellow user or somebody that steps on a needle in a park, is that a factor? Because that, that carries a bit of weight for me. But at the, I, I want the data, and I want local data, not national data. I want to know if it makes a difference here in Fresno County. But that's a very good point, Nina. Okay. All right. Now, with that, uh, let me see if there's any other comments. No, we're going to move to uh, – let's bring on uh, George. There it is. There is George and Rodney. Good evening, gents. Good uh, evening, gentlemen. So let, let's start off with you, George. Uh, tell the GB Wire audience what is ACE. Uh, give us some background, and how do you work to remove that or reduce that, or uh, what is the process? And 
and and why do you why are you passionate and care about this item? And then then we're going to go to um, Mr. Lowry. Um, Darius, thank you. And uh, ACEs is uh, uh, an, an acronym for, for <laughs> adverse childhood experiences, and the term was developed from a study that was done in 1996 by um, Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control. And it was a survey done. Uh, they surveyed about 17,000 people and asked these folks uh, 10 simple questions. They're there on the screen there for you. It's called the ACE test. You can, you know, take it, takes you five minutes. And uh, it would ask, they asked the people in the survey, if you, uh, happened to experience one of these 10 things uh, before you turned 18. And uh, if you did a number of those, depending on the score of your test, if you scored high, the, uh, re the research showed that you would, on average, be inclined to live 20 years less than, than somebody who had not, and that you were vulnerable to personal <clears throat> health issues like diabetes, uh, alcoholism, um, heart problems, but that you are also prone to have social problems. Uh, you know, uh, the, the survey done showed all the mass murderers had very high ACE scores. They were unresolved issues that happened in their childhood <clears throat> that left a lasting scar. And um, because they weren't remediated or dealt with, it um, uh, it, it really is the 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 what I love about the ACE study is that it highlights the negative impacts that dysfunctional and broken families have, not only on children and their how it affects their futures, but our society as well. And um, uh, this this program is being used by a lot of folks that are realizing the value of it. I think a lot of people that become aware of it, um, uh, you know, a, a light bulb goes on and it's able to reflect what they're doing in their lives. I, this has been a passion, I think for me for the longest time, for the time that I was involved in politics, I've often felt that we were not dealing with kind of the underlying, an unknown underlying issue. And that is the breakdown of our social fabric due to the uh, breakdown of, of families. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion that the more we focus on remediating this and or uh, reducing the occurrences of ACEs, uh, the, the better chance we have of, of remending the social fabric and restoring our country. Cause I get this feeling that we're losing our footing. And, and, uh, I think that, um, uh, dealing with ACEs is the real ticket to, to making families stronger. And once you do that, you begin to pull society back together again. And uh, from a political perspective, you begin to build a conservative constituency, uh, in your communities. And um, it's, to me, dealing with ACEs and focusing on it is just a win-win issue for everybody, uh, adults and children, and can only make life better in California. So um, that's it in a nutshell. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've known Rodney for more than 10 years. Rodney is the police chaplain for uh, uh, the city of Fresno, deals with um, high ACE scores on a daily basis, lives with it, and has some fascinating insight on what we can do in our communities to begin to elim eliminate them, and um, uh, by reaching both adults and children that are, have been affected by this. Thank you for that, uh, George. Uh, let's bring Rodney in, and, and let's talk about maybe a more in-depth uh, solutions on okay. How do we? How, how do you make this? How do you remove or uh, reduce aces? Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, one thing I, I, I do know, and I'm mm -hmm. confident in saying, is that uh, had we uh, had we taken this aces crisis as serious as it is uh, presented itself when the original uh, research was done, we wouldn't have to worry as much doing. Uh, uh, needle exchanges in the park, we might be able to do more book exchanges uh, at the library because every every uh, addict, um, homeless person that we've ever had a conversation with and and talked about, you know, their present living condition, 
Uh, that conversation has always been traced back to uh, something that has happened to them in their childhood, and they never received ser uh, services and, and never really recovered from that hurt or that trauma. Okay, Mike. So uh, just for folks that may not know, so Rod Lowry, um, who I'm going to tell you why he's an amazing person. He was, our ch he was a police officer for a very long time. How many years was it, Rod? Oh, I think it was probably about 16 years total with different okay. agencies. Then he was our, he ran our chaplaincy. Now he runs the Resiliency Center. So when I was interested in running for office and I was doing the fact-finding and learning, I was very fortunate to do a lot of ride-alongs. I also met Rodney at this time and really educated me on what we call ACEs now, but being able to see firsthand the kind of trauma children face. Uh, there's one call we always talk about. I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but very rough thing that a four-year-old had to go through in Southeast Fresno and the family not knowing how to deal with that. So one of the things we do when, when there's domestic violence calls, for example, we're lucky to have the Marjorie Mason Center. Our officers know to call them. But that's the kind of thing that maybe should be coordinated at a much larger level. So city and county governments know how to respond if there is domestic violence, if there is housing insecurity, because these are all traumas that affect kids growing up. And then there's no way to talk about it and process it. And it turns into, I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Ronovich, turns into anger that builds up. And maybe you get attracted to gang life, or you get attracted to something else, and you don't focus on the things you need to focus on because you have no support group. So Absolutely. Anger, depression, hopelessness, and then which turns into addictions and then eventually yep. incarceration. Yep. Exactly. You know, there's you uh, briefly... uh, uh, I, I yeah. use this as kind of a comparison if there, there's this, um, uh, you know, we all know the fellow named Neely who was uh, subdued on the New York subway strangled to death by that uh, former Marine. And unfortunately, um, the guy passed away. We know that, uh, and we George, George, hold on that, one second. that uh, some, the guy that subdued him. George, hold on. Uh, we have some te technical difficulties. I'm trying to put a slide, slides 14 and 15 up, if uh, what we have, because I want the audience to see some of the solutions and the other uh, resiliency centers. Can you uh, chat? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. Uh, yes, that fellow that was killed on the subway, um, he, he was, uh, when he was a child, his father abandoned him. And uh, at eight years old, he watched his stepfather strangle his mother to death. And then after that, the guy had no, um, no, no uh, support system whatsoever. And I think what, one of the amazing thing is, is that we spend so much in schools and education providing free lunch sex ed all this other stuff but it never gets down to what's really um affecting damaged yeah. kids and that is the trauma that they experience in the home and um so you know what i am proposing is uh is an initiative to where um the uh through law that health and human services and uh law enforcement and education systems uh, come together and form in every county a citizen advisory group and giving uh, health and human services somewhat of a mandate to fix this problem, basically declaring war on ACEs so that uh, every community would be charged with coming up with a solution to, uh, to, to end this. And I, I use the, um, the mandate that was created for the Sigma, which is the uh, um, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, as an example, where the government can come in and say, you know, this is a problem. They identify the problem. They designate areas like counties and they say, OK, you've got five years to solve this problem. Otherwise, you, you're going to be penalized. And uh, in a way, I look at it as a, a, a way uh, as a mandate on our bureaucracy in health and human services to say, fix this problem. Because the money that's spent on on these projects really just grow a bureaucracy. I've not seen a decline in any of the numbers, and um, uh, the the family continues to break down. So in, in my way, it's a way of being able to say to agencies and communities, we have to deal with this problem. We have to focus on it and and get it resolved. Um, it's a it's a wonderful focus, I think, as a way to rebuild our society our cultural fabric and thereby reducing incarceration rates crime improving education all the uh, all the social indicators are improved by this one move 
you know, I'm just reading some, some of these stats uh, that uh, you've provided, or Paul, is, did, did these come from um, George? Okay. Okay, so slide 20, which we cannot, we have another technical difficulty again. Sorry about that, gents, uh, and the audience. Uh, juveniles at, at risk. California places more juveniles in secure confinement than any other state in the country. Nearly 20,000 youth are held in the state's secure facilities. That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Doris, you know, when I was on patrol, I could remember arresting juveniles. Hold on, let's, let's get the right, you have the wrong person. Let's get Rodney on, or at least George. There we go. Oh, we can't put, it sounds like we have a, we can't put the slide on and the speaker at the same time. So, Rodney, uh, please take it away. Try it again. Yeah, Try as, again. A, uh, as, as okay. a young officer, I can remember arresting juveniles that maybe committed some sort of uh, crime, and, and I, can, I can vividly remember asking them, you know, what's wrong with you? Why would you do that to somebody? And I think what we're learning now, some 30 years later, is the better question would be, hey, what happened to you? Tell me your story. Uh, so we can learn and, and help you move through that. Because certainly asking a child what's wrong with them is a, is a uh, trajectory for incarceration. If we can ask that question, what happened to you? I think we can change that trajectory. There was a, a slide that you put up previous, uh, Doris, that uh, I think it was produced by um, the APA, American Psychological Association. And the quote was something to the effect of most children and adolescents exposed to trauma will never be identified. Subsequently, they will never receive treatment. And, and we know that when trauma happens to someone and uh, there's an onset of a uh, de developing disorder, research tells us that it's 11 years from onset to the time that person would actually seek treatment. So every time we have a child exposed to trauma and there is a, a development of, of some sort of depression, anxiety, whatever that may be, we know on average, it's going to be 11 years of a miserable life leading until uh, hopefully treatments available. And what we're talking about today, and a lot of this research and, and what we learn actually came from, uh, you know, working together with you and the Granville family as we were identifying juveniles who ran away through the Fresno Police Department and offering mentoring services. Uh, the common theme throughout all of our conversations was that these juveniles had trauma early in their childhood and were never, it, those traumas never identified and they never got any assistance. So that's, uh, that's what the Resiliency Center and your efforts have, you know, working with us all these years has really led to the genesis of this idea of resiliency centers saying, no, there, wait a minute, we can identify the trauma. We have just chosen in the past not to. And, and I can explain that if you'd like. Uh, uh, yeah, well, before we get to that, Rodney, uh, I, I do want to get to that. I want to ask a question of Mr. Rodonovich. So, can you talk about some of the things you think we could do at the state level to create policy that can kind of change the system so people like Rodney and the Resiliency Center can actually get buy-in from local governments and other entities to actually work with them? Because they know yeah. what yeah. needs to be done. Uh, happy to. I've got a, a page and a half legislative summary that, and you know, I'm running for office, right. God willing, I get elected. First thing I'll do is drop it into a legislative, the, the legislative yes. council within the assembly and have them draft a bill. But it would direct uh, human services, law enforcement, and oh, wait a minute. Uh, He's education up. to come together and develop uh, okay. a, a plan for every county. You can find it on my website, george2024.com. It's listed there, and you can take a look at it. And it gives it uh, a, a certain <clears throat> amount of time to develop these plans and start addressing it within their communities. One thing I would say is that... Um, uh, you know, I treat ACEs like, like a person who is flying in an airplane and you have uh, um, a, a problem in the aircraft and the oxygen masks come down and they'll always tell you, you know, adults secure your mask first before you help your child. And ACEs is just as important for adults as it is kids. 
And there's a there's a few factors I think that need to happen in order for this to become effective in communities. One is that the the effect of ACEs on children and adults has to become common knowledge throughout the state. So there's going to have to be uh, in this proposal that I put together, we would declare it a statewide emergency in order to get the attention on the issue, because adults who don't even know they're doing this, if they've had high test scores and childhood trauma that they haven't become resilient from. And um, so, so it would be a big promotion on the issue. It would force uh, local governments. I had a health and human services um, director in Mariposa County take a look at what I'm doing. And I, and I asked him, cause I'm a conservative. I don't want to spend a lot of money on this. Um, and he said, George, he said, the value of this ACE legislation is that it's like baking a cake. We already have the manpower, all the ingredients. We have the manpower. We have the uh, funding is all there. What we lack is the recipe. And this ACE program or plan that I have is the recipe in that, you, you know, it helps this us begin to focus on what's important and, and it, it doesn't have all the answers. I mean, you, you have to, you know, aside from increasing the visibility of effects of ACEs in society, there are ways you've got to have good resiliency programs that bring people uh, from dependence to independence. You've got to have uh, uh, good data to measure it. Uh, the outcomes like um, improved school attendance, improved school grades, less crime, less incarceration. And you've got to, there's got to be some teeth in it, some penalties involved if uh, if our health and human services agencies don't meet those goals. Uh, so it's it's uh, that's kind of a genesis or a, a, a general description of of what I view as a plan. What question? Uh, there's several comments coming in, and I know Mike has got a couple of questions for you. Uh, but some of the comments, Chrissy Falk, and from Inga. It sounds like the creation of another unfunded mandate with no clear plan of execution, uh, more bureaucracy. Are we going to have another state government agency interference? Uh, is it absolutely needed? It sounds like, you know, ACEs, ACEs is an issue. Uh, do we have to create another agency? Uh, it's not fun. Can, t t talk, us, talk, to us, talk to the audience and to us about that. You, you're asking for creation of another agency, or, or uh, how are you going to address this? Not at all. And the real danger is that in this, you know, the government that we have in California, you have to take very big precautions to make sure that that's not the case. Again, the, the money's being spent on these social programs, and the manpower is there. What they lack is the focus. And this... This legislation would just be, you know, you are going to achieve these results in a certain amount of time, and you're going to use the existing funds that you already have in order to do it. Um, okay. I, I, if I do enter the legislature, this would need to be accomplished on a on a bipartisan basis. But I know the beauty of ACEs, and that is when it comes to kids, you know, you've got the interest of of uh, all political persuasions. And, you know, I think a real hard to be able to help on something like this. I think that what you would use, though, is a, uh, you would need to use a statewide ballot initiative uh, as a backstop to make sure that any legislation that goes through Sacramento does not create another bloated bureaucracy that doesn't have any insult, uh, uh, results. So, you know, uh, uh, once the bill is drafted, what I would do is hold hearings with um, law enforcement and all the agencies, health and human services, education, figure out ways that people can uh, put this thing together and start answer, putting flesh to the bones to make sure that that this is only provides focus, not another bureaucracy, but but it's but it's aimed toward outcomes that will put this uh, our society, our state and country back together again. And well, I think that's you. the beauty of ACE, is if it's used properly. Right, Mike, Let me ahead. ask a follow-up question. So California has a supermajority with the Democratic Party. This seat you're running for is more than likely, if I was a betting person to say, it's going to stay with the Republicans. Asking George. My question for George is, how are you going to work with the Democratic supermajority to get this bill passed? 
because the current occupant has had very diff a lot of difficulty getting anything passed in Sacramento. The current occupant being Jim Patterson, right. is that correct? Okay, you're outnumbered. Yeah. Well, I, I think you tried by uh, by being bipartisan. On the issue, people, the, the Democrats absolutely love this issue of ACEs. They had uh, the governor appointed uh, the first uh, Surgeon General. She was a fantastic advocate of ACEs. But um, that that will bring people to you. I mean, uh, it, you know, it's a conservative, I view it as a conservative issue, if done right, that will bring uh, liberals and independents to you. Uh, everybody wants to do this. There, there will be there are pitfalls because again, I don't want to spend any more money in this. I won't support it. An effort that would so uh, that's an example of some of the roadblocks that you're going to go into. But there's, in my view, <clears throat> I would sell this if I can't sell it on a bipartisan way in the California legislature. I would develop it as a ballot initiative as a way to strike back against a lot of the foolish uh, initiatives in California. And uh, as you know, once a ballot proposition is passed, it's set in stone. The legislature can't fiddle with it. So um, I, I would use the ballot initiative as a backstop, but, uh, but you will always want to kind of start out on a bipartisan basis. Uh, simply uh, because that, George, that's the power that, in Sacramento. George, let me ask you uh, another couple of questions from Inga. The criminals who cause the trauma right now don't even get prosecuted. Why don't we start there and keep these perpetrators in prison or jail? And then we have CPS, Child Protective uh, Services, to address family issues and trauma as it happens. How is that working for us? Well, it's not, yes. and that's. Uh, I keep coming to the point where, where, uh, for example, I, I have a friend who's a, a, a coach in high school, and he had a kid come up to him uh, in the morning at the in a game. He didn't have his basketball jersey with him, and he and he said, you know, he had a problem that night. His mom, who's a single parent, she's a single parent. She's a crack addict. She threw up all over his uniform, and he didn't know what to do. And he came to school without it. Yeah. It, Everybody wants to manage the problem. Nobody wants to deal with the real problem. And that is putting families back together. And that's what this ACE initiative can do by focusing on the trauma that's done to kids by broken and dysfunctional homes. And we start dealing with the, the real issue that's tearing the fabric apart in our society instead of, instead of figuring out ways to contain it we're figuring out ways to fix it. Let me piggyback off of that. And I, I want Rodney to talk us of his experience, law enforcement and experience in resiliency. So last week at, by Roosevelt High School, this new driver, I think he was 17 or 18, rammed into a bus stop and a whole a group of kids, I think eight kids were injured. 11. Not, 11, excuse me. Luckily, the worst case was a broken leg, which is serious when you're 11 and still growing, but you're, the, the, sure. the children are alive. I was really amazed that the DA and the police <clears throat> arrested and are prosecuting the mother for abetting this person because apparently he uh, allegedly he was on marijuana he was high on uh, or rather intoxicated because of marijuana and I feel like normally in California we let everyone get away with everything so where do you balance let's say prosecuting parents and holding them responsible but at the same time you got a home now there's no parent maybe they're not a good parent who comes in in that case Rodney where, where do you think the balance is well, currently, you know, no one, and and you're right. I mean, we don't hold people accountable. And those that uh, uh, whether they committed the crime or they assisted um, in a crime, like uh, his mother had. If we uh, if we dug into her background, we're probably dealing or looking at generational trauma. I mean, why why is she the way she is? Why did she parent the way? She parents, and and now why is her child um, continuing down that same trajectory? And I, you know, I'm quite quite convinced that uh, the argument can be made from childhood trauma that was never identified and and subsequently never dealt with. Let me. I'm going to jump in uh, Inga's last question, and I'm going to come to uh, uh, Joe Martinez, but. Inga's last question is for George. How has government ever put families put together? What is government? Uh, when, when did government come in? In other words, are you suggesting that government should play a big role in putting uh, families together? 
That's no, not works. at all. I, I yeah. think it's using the force of law to focus on what really matters. I think, in, in you know, I'd like to say the human race is too busy racing and we need the force of law to get them to for, focus on what's important. And, uh, 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 you know, I don't see it as, I, I, I see the re, I see the um, uh, health and human services and, and law enforcement and schools being facilitators in the community by develop and and it's a citizens advisory group that really comes together and, and develops the answers for this thing. So they're community led, but uh, but the uh, the agencies are the ones that are charged with dealing with this, and they can be facilitators in order to get people to uh, community groups as citizens to develop a program that would begin to find some answers in resolving this. Uh, Joe has a question or a comment. Joe Martinez, uh, I'm concerned that our Health and Human Services and Department of Social Services, DSS and HHS programs are already underfunded and people are overworked. Such plans have been pushed. pushed and well, what I would say is um... uh, And I'm not convinced we need another plan. What we need is action on current initiatives and give it time to work. Comments on that, George? Uh, we do need another plan. Uh, for example, the, the state has spent $15 billion uh, trying to solve homelessness, and it's been wasted uh, wasted money. I, I met with a, a group uh, in, in Sacramento recently. It, it's the group that, that a union that um, they're prison guard unions. So they deal with uh, managing the state's prisons. And they are the recipient of a lot of the backlash against law enforcement that we're seeing today. And they will tell you that millions and millions of dollars, if not billions, have been spent on, you know, uh, the the issue for lack of, of, of respect for authority and for the problems that we're facing out there. And it's completely wasted money. They're crying for something that they can offer that uh, is is something that really does begin to solve problems. Um, the way I look at it is that we're all busy building uh, the house of, of our state and country, but we're, our foundation is crumbling because of the nuclear family has disintegrated. And I view ACEs as a way to rebuild the nuclear family and start uh, rebuilding the country. And that's what I'm aiming for in this. That's my objective. So this is really inspiring our viewers. One viewer just wrote, George, we need you to run, run on the idea to remove criminals from the streets and homes to keep the kids safe. So I wanna ask both George and Rodney a question. Where is that balance? You wanna keep kids safe. They've got generational trauma. So maybe the parent is repeating that trauma but that parent is still inflicting trauma. At what point do you separate them? <clears throat> or is it healing with the group? Because I, I, I know some of the resiliency work is that healing process. Where do you draw the line? Well, I think you draw the line wherever that child is in danger, um, whether it's physically or emotionally. If, uh, if that child needs to be pulled out of that environment, that's when you do it. Um, always seeking to reunite. But uh, you know that old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And, yeah. and it's so true, even in uh, therapy, you know, until somebody is really committed to change, uh, let's talk, you know, for a moment about a parent who first realizes um, that they parent out of their own experiences when they were young, until they come to a position where they're willing to, to look hard in that mirror and then work really hard uh, to change the the way they think, and uh, which uh, which controls behavior. Um, I mean, it's a tough road. Okay. Uh, Joe Joe had another point. Uh, there are uh, DSS workers at school sites, and all kids should have a mental health assessment done, so we know how to treat our kids. George. Um, or Rodney. You know what, Com Rodney, I think it might be a good time to, to uh, talk about the app that you're creating because I, it, it to me, it's a perfect example of the coordination that needs to happen between law enforcement and education and human services 
uh, this app, I, I think, would help explain a lot. Uh, if you were, if you had a chance to say it, I think it'd be great. Uh, yeah. Rodney, before, before you get there, so Joe's comment: uh, DSS workers at school sites, and all kids should go should have a mental health assessment done, so we know how to treat our kids. Comments on that? Um. I, I think it would help, but I think it has to be in, conduct, uh, in conjunction with uh, a, a program out there that offers real insight and for the people to be able to, not only children are identified that way, but their parents as well, and, and, and provides a path for them to deal with if, if they come up with a real negative assessment, what are you going to do about it? You know, and, and uh, there could be <clears throat> programs that are required for parents and families to have to go to? I don't know, but I okay. but I think that we need to focus on the issue and come up with the answers. Rodney, tell us about your app, the app you're, you're, you're working on. And Inga, had, I, I don't know, this must have been something George said. Inga's question, what government agency failed and left a crack addict mom in charge of the children? I, I guess my answer is I want to make sure there's less crack addict moms out there doing harm to kids. And okay. the, 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 pub, the the increased knowledge about the effects of ACEs on children will produce less moms on cracks with no father in the home. I mean, that's how I, that's, that's what I'm aiming at. Got it. Okay. Chrissy Falk, uh, comment, this is too, so com complex, very difficult. We have a failing system. We need this to be tied into our welfare system. Participate to get paid. Well, so yesterday was the anniversary of 9-11. And, you know, terrible tragedy. We have these documentaries that talk about how it happened, the 9-11 report. So we had this big bureaucracy. We had the CIA, we had the FBI, we had all these entities, State Department, and they, they saw the pieces, but they weren't connecting. I kind of feel like that's maybe what George is talking about now, that we have this, these systems in place, but when you have a case, they're not connecting, and these kids are just being kind of, we're doing our token job of assessing, but not coming out with any outcomes. Is that kind of what where, where this is headed? This is more coordination amongst the bureaucracies? Yeah, and uh, Rodney uh, uh, and his explanation of that app is a perfect... Uh, solution for that siloing they call it or whatever the term right. is there you go. Where, where agencies are just not speaking to each other okay okay Ed, uh, tell us about the advisory board uh, uh what, what is that well I, I, again uh what i would do is submit um my brief which you can find on the website at george2024.com and uh get a piece of legislation then start holding public hearings with citizens groups, private nonprofits, not just a law enforcement, schools and health departments, but also stakeholders in the community, humanitarian aid organizations, private ones, Joe Citizen, Joe and Joan Citizen, uh, to, to, get, uh, to get everybody to focus on what the problem is so that we can create answers that, re that end up reducing these occurrences. Um, so, it, you know, the, all, are, are all the answers there, are the solutions right in front of us? No, but, we, but this bill would set us on a track to where we find those solutions and then we start implementing them. Okay, so Rodney, you, now, now the, re, your, the Resiliency Center does have an advisory board. Can you tell us a little bit about the advisory board, what they do? And you have a pretty good diverse group of people. Oh, just an awesome group of people. Yeah, they a uh, collection of uh, yeah. stakeholders in the uh, city of Fresno, some business pers personnel that uh, just kind of keep us uh, mission oriented, um, challenge me as far as my leadership and working in an organization. We've moved from a non or a, a small nonprofit uh, that was the Fresno Police Chaplaincy into a, a quickly growing, uh, robust a mental health nonprofit, and uh, the dynamics for me are certainly changing. So uh, there are a group of people here in Fresno that just challenge me and, and my leadership and, and making sure that uh, I stay uh, committed to the cause. Uh, Inga had another question. You want to ask that, uh, Mike? 
for basically about different kids, kids oh. in the same family growing up. One becomes a rocket scientist and an attorney. The other one needs a lot of attorneys to bail them out of jail. Right. Have you noticed that, Rodney? Me? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead George, same sorry. family. Let me make sure that we get the uh, question correctly. How kids from the same family with the same experience of dysfunction turn out differently as adults? Some are criminals, others are productive citizens. Can they talk on that? Okay, that the, the two of you, gentlemen. Well, I, I certainly can speak uh, um, through observation. I remember years ago, we had two young boys in, in our home, as a matter of fact, that uh, we met the families through church and some things that happened. So we ended up with the boys uh, a couple of years. And, you know, one, uh, one is a uh, police officer and one is on parole. Um, same same <laughs> environment. Right. Um, so you know, so genetic. So any different experiences. Is it, is it different experiences, different genes? Uh, is it has something to do with the mm -hmm. parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts? Nature versus nurture, that whole thing, that argument. Well, no, in the, yeah. I mean, right, is it, yeah. does genetics play a big role in that? I mean, because our genes get passed down, right? Yep, and they're not Levi's, right. they're the other kind of genes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Those, I, I believe, are more anomalies. Um, I, I, I think that when I mention nuclear families, not perfect, but I, I think as a culture, we look at nuclear families and see that they're not perfect, so we destroy it. And uh, we go to all kinds of alternatives, and kids end up being detached from the people that love them the most. And I, I, that's what we have to turn around. I, I think the, the, um, the, uh, we, we ought to be a culture that values uh, nuclear families and does all it can in order to equip and enable parents to be better parents. But I, you know, I just, we go the opposite direction and uh, sure you're going to have anomalies like that. Things happen, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but by and large, the science and the evidence goes, and that's what this a study shows is that the higher these kids uh, experience adverse childhood experiences, okay. uh, mainly because of mistakes made by parents knowingly or unknowingly, um, and especially in broken and dysfunctional families, is a real burden okay. on our, our, not only for All that right. person, George, the we're going to leave society. it there. Thank you for that. Uh, if uh, Rod, Rodney, or you have any final thoughts or any uh, of uh, closing comments, 30 seconds or less, because we have one other item I want to I want to wrap up with uh, after you guys are done. Uh, Rodney, yeah, I'll we'll start with you. Really and, and, let's, and 30 seconds or less, final thoughts. Um, really quickly, we're trying to address that through the Resiliency Center. We've created an app for first responders. Anytime they're mm -hmm. on a call and they're out with a family and a child's been exposed to trauma, they can use that app. And which will automatically direct that family and that child right into clinical counseling at the Resiliency Center. What we can do is we can rebut the uh, APA assessment that kids can't be identified. We can identify them through this app and we can close that 11 year gap of uh, treatment and we can replace 11 years um, of misery and um, uh, depletion of their personhood to growth and, and hopefulness. So we're just hoping people will uh, will see the value in that app. It is downloadable from Apple and Android. What's the name of the app? Resiliency Center. Okay, Resilience Resiliency Center and 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 the app store. Okay, uh, George. Uh, Darius, thank you so much, and Mike, for having us on, on the program. I just think that this, this issue gives us a, the ability mm -hmm. to turn our country around. And I think for anybody who feels <laughs> hopeless about the direction of this country, we got to focus on this issue. And I may not have all the answers with it, but we have to focus on it and come up with the answers. Thank you, George. Uh, one last question came in for uh, Rodney from Joe Martinez. Uh, where does uh, Rodney refer runaway and homeless kids to now that the sanctuary is closed? Rodney, that question we, for, uh, for you. You, you, you want me to repeat the question? 
No, no, I heard you do know that the sanctuary has closed. Um, I know that the city center is building out a uh, a place for for homeless uh, runaways that should be launching soon. So that will be that will be our referral to uh, it will be the uh, the new city center off of Dakota and Blackstone. In fact, your facility is located Can right right in that campus, right? Right, right. we yeah, are. That's we're, great. We're part of that campus. Yeah, awesome. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for joining us. And on the last word, uh, we have a, there's a story of a Central Valley farm worker turned NASA astronaut. Uh, it was now being, been, which uh, that story has been turned into a movie. Uh, Jose Hernandez is played by Michael Pena in the movie A Million Miles Away. Have you, you know, heard about that? I heard something uh, like a week ago. I saw it on Amazon. So I, I can't, can't wait to watch this. It's a good, it's going to be great. Yeah. Will air on Amazon Prime Great. on Friday, September fifteenth, which is uh, this this Friday. There's a movie called End of Watch. Michael Pena was in. If you want to understand what law enforcement goes, it's very hard to watch. Very good film. He was also on in, on the last season of uh, Jack Ryan. Oh, was he? Yeah. And Chips. It's a good one too. Okay. Chips is funny. <laughs> very, very very cool actor. And yeah. how cool to have somebody from Central California. I think uh, Stockton. That's great. Uh, Jose Hernandez uh, into into NASA. Uh, on that note, I want to thank George uh, Radonovich and uh, Rodney Lowry for joining us tonight. George is a candidate for state assembly as a Republican, and I've asked him, why do you as a Republican want to go up there, uh, a super minority, not even a minority, super minority being the assembly? He said, well, aces. I said, okay, uh, tell us about aces, and, and he did that tonight. Thank you, George, for joining us this evening. Uh, and Rodney Lowry. Thank you for the great work you've done over the years and decades uh, in, in, in law enforcement and in helping kids and, and uh, educate and bring, really being the part of the education program as well. Thank you to both and thank you to all of our viewers this evening. Mike. Thank Chris, you, thank gentlemen. You. Thank you. On behalf of all of us at uh, GB Wire, have a great week. We'll see you next uh, Tuesday night. Good night. Good night, guys.